Uh, I know how many invitations you get. It's easy to RSVP to everything and then make decisions later. So we're all extremely appreciative that you prioritize breakfast with us this morning. Uh, my name is Phyllis Farrell, and I am very pleased to be in C today for our first in-person friends and family event for the Douglas Alzheimer's Collaborative uh, Health System Preparedness Work Group. So we have um, a, basically a full update for you to catch everybody up on how much progress we've made uh, since kicking off this initiative commissioned by the World Economic Forum in 2020. So for those of you that don't know the origin story at a very, very high level, um, we have been, as an Alzheimer's community, incredibly successful in uh, getting dementia and Alzheimer's disease on the agenda for basically all the major multilaterals. So the World Health Organization, the United Nations, the OECD, G7, G20, many of you were part of those initiatives. But what we found was things were just staying on paper and not dropping down to actually make change for the patients that we all want to serve. And so some work across the community, and a lot of other groups from George Vredenberg, we um, commissioned the world, asked the World Economic Forum to commission their third major global health initiative, only behind Gabi and Sepi, which many of you are familiar with, and that's where the Douglas Alzheimer's Collaborative came along. So you'll hear a little bit high level at the, at the enterprise that's going on today, but our primary, our primary discussion today is going to be around system preparedness. So who are all of you? Who are our friends and family? You guys are our partners. You're the ones that have been with us since we commissioned this. We've got funders in the room, we've got sites in the room and investigators, we've got strategic partners who have helped us with project program design, uh, project execution, and even dissemination. And um, we couldn't be more thrilled that you're here. So I am going to Hit my slides. Sorry, Melissa. Alyssa made, and Kate made these beautiful slides. So this is friends and family. Sorry. Volume two. Um, we do have a lot of fun, so hopefully we'll be doing that today. And um, we are going to ask because we've got a couple of presenters that you hold your questions at the end that we still have should have opportunity for questions, or if not, you can certainly grab somebody on the, on the way out. So 2020, the year it all began. Um, Alyssa might kill me for having asked for these maps. Um, so big thank you to Alyssa Kersman, who was actually my partner in crime back in 2020 when we were designing this program with several of you that were on the first work group. So the first thing we did was we launched our early detection flagship program, and we actually have flagship sites here in the room with us. That was seven programs in six countries. Then we launched our early detection grant program, which added um, another set of programs to get us to 19 programs in 12 countries. We have DAC grantees from that early detection program. You'll notice we also picked up low, uh, additional low and middle income countries with that grant program. Still all talking about early detection of cognitive impairment. Now we're launching our accurate diagnosis program and we have several of those sites here. That's building us to 27 programs in 14 countries. Very, very exciting. This group is figuring out how to use blood biomarkers um, and uh, advanced diagnostics. So moving us, not just in early detection of cognitive impairment, but onto an accurate diagnosis. And 80 Riddle. So we do have some 80 Riddle partners here. 80 Riddle is uh, the real world implementation of detection and diagnosis and lifestyle engagement. It is an IHI program based in Europe. Um, and DAC is providing the implementation science arm for that program. And um, that takes us to 34 programs, now putting us in 18 countries. This is what happens here, I get to sit in the front of the room. <laughs> <laughs> and so what are we doing today? You'll hear about some new programs today. But by uh, the, and, oh, and we'll actually catalyze activity before we do that. One of the things that's really important for DAC is that we are really just catalyzing the transformation. We are trying not to create bricks and mortar solutions that need to be sustained through alternative funding. So instead, the goal is to give seed funding to these programs to get things started and help uh, make sure that they've got sustainable programs. And what's really fun about this is not only are we seeing that happen, 
Um, so you'll see some of our early detection programs. You know, Indiana University is here. They're sitting back here. They picked up and finished their program and moved on to the next um, sustainable uh, growth of that program that really DAC just gets to sit back and be a cheerleader for. So we love our catalyzed activity. But this is the really exciting part. By the end of 2024, we will have 49 programs in 18 countries as we add Brain Health Navigators and the RFI for the Early Detection Blueprint, which closed today. Um, and I just heard from Mike that we have 28 applications for those 10 sites. So that is incredibly exciting. So you'll hear a little about that. So um, we'll have to figure out how to get one more programming in by the end of 2024, so we can hit 50. None of this would be possible without our uh, funders, our site partners, and our strategic partners who provide their tools and resources in kind for our sites. And so the list is here. This is a living list, though. It's on our website. So if you know someone else who wants to come partner our fund or be part of us, our DAC family, there is more than enough room in the table. So what are we going to do today? Uh, Alyssa, I'm looking at my notes to make sure I hit everything. Uh, you're going to hear from Drew Holtzapfel, who's going to talk a little about the DAC Enterprise to anchor you. Tim McLeod, who's leading the health system preparedness program, is going to give you an update. Amy and Karen are going to talk about the Accurate Diagnosis Program, which is the project that's launching right now. And Mike Hornbecker, one of our newest employees, is going to talk about the RFI that I mentioned. I'll come back on and talk to you about our newest program, and then George is going to close. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Drew. Thanks, everyone. Ten ten foot ladders, and you can't get up a hundred foot wall with ten ten foot ladders. 
So everything in the Alzheimer's space feels like it's subscale and it's not linked. So then our starting point with the Davos Alzheimer's Collaborative was to go out and figure out how we could add global reach to a lot of really important efforts. So, so this has been one area of focus. The other thing that we, really motivates us is a point that this slide makes. We need to have the innovation that we're hearing about here today available globally. So we can't achieve our goal of stopping Alzheimer's if we're limited in where the drugs, the diagnostics, and the advanced care, uh, the, the innovation and care reaches. So the work that we want to do has to be global. And when you look at this slide, the important takeaway is that if you look at uh, the work on uh, uh, genomics, the, we do 10% uh, of the work, or we do 90% we do of the work in 10% of the population. It's all uh, Western white ancestry. So to really advance Alzheimer's, we need to get into parts of the world that haven't had uh, research, haven't had the innovation and care delivery and access to uh, new technologies. So you're going to hear about our program today, which is the Healthcare System Preparedness. You'll see uh, it's number three down there. We have three programs our DAC. Uh, the first one is a, a global cohort. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But the idea here is that you can go into these um, existing longitudinal uh, research platforms and add measures that are relevant to Alzheimer's. And so by going into these diverse uh, longitudinal uh, cohorts, then you can start to find uh, new hints for drug development, new ideas for associated biomarkers. And so you can really uh, drive forward precision medicine. So that's, a, that's program number one. Program number two is uh, to expand clinical trials, uh, do them better, faster, cheaper. We worked with the team here that, in the US that really built this platform. Uh, we took that platform to Europe, and we have about 30 sites in Europe that are all operating together to move better, faster, and cheaper. And now what we want to do is go to other parts of the world and bring uh, clinical trial research to those, uh, to those areas as well. We are a Swiss organization, we're a Swiss foundation, and we're a US 501c3. You can see our board members up here. Uh, I've mentioned Elias. We also have, of course, uh, our friend Frida Lewis Hall, who uh, I work with, but I was an advisor. Uh, Julio Frank is the former Minister of Health from Mexico and probably one of the best thinkers in public health. Uh, Victor Zhao is internationally known for his work in public health. Margaret Chan, thanks to the World Economic Forum, is an advisor to us. And uh, we have one of the, uh, the former chief medical officer from MHLW on the board as well. So it's a small board, but this is a very engaged board. It's a, a board that really uh, focuses on, on the big strategic issues and helps drive us forward. I want to just give you a sense of some of the work. You saw how many sites that we're working in. Uh, we'll talk about the, through the healthcare system team. Um, this map is uh, looking at some of the ways that we put together our research projects. As I mentioned, we, we have a belief that things are subscale and not linked. And so a lot of the times what we're doing is we're taking organizations and providing the resources for them to work together. So we're linking these organizations together. A great example is we've started with Aga Khan University in Nairobi, uh, Kenya. And what we're doing there is we're validating tools for detection and diagnosis in that population. And as we uh, implement these tools and validate these tools, we're starting to build a clinical trial-ready population that will then be able to go take non-pharmacological and pharmacological uh, uh, interventions to. So it starts at Aga Khan University in Kenya, but if you know the Aga Khan network, it stretches from Kenya to London. And, uh, and everywhere in between. And in a lot of the countries they work in, they are the de facto government healthcare system. Uh, so we're going to go to every Ag Khan University site uh, and start to spread this work. Another uh, area where we're focused on creating the linkage is uh, we're looking at the impact of climate change on brain health. And so we're doing that in Kenya, Colombia, and Chile. And what, we're working with IHME to take their satellite data, and then we're putting wearables on the ground to measure the exposure the, to toxins, heat, and then we're also doing biosample collection. So we think this is a way that we can start to understand the impact of climate change uh, on brain health, but also gets us into a whole new set of funders who are funding climate, uh, climate change efforts. So that's, a, that's one uh, other kind of set of linkages 
But you know, when you think about a lot of these sites that we're linking, we're linking data collection, whether it's saliva for a polygenic risk score, whether it's digital voice, bloods, smell, wearables, retina scans. Uh, all these are meant to create a, a, a bigger set of data that we can use to go do research on. Uh, so let me go and just give you kind of one last uh, snapshot here of the road ahead. We think these are uh, the, the big milestones that we'll be achieving as we move forward. Uh, you know, whether it's longitudinal research or clinical research, it's just not at a global scale. So we've talked a little bit about how we're going to do that. Uh, we're also going to build these clinical trial ready populations. Uh, we have a great uh, effort moving forward in South Korea where we're starting to take their bio samples in, out of a well characterized population uh, and running uh, assays on them and giving them the data back. And this is a key piece of the work that we're doing is we generate the data and the data goes back to the cohort. The cohort data also goes on to a Gates Ventures funded platform. And so that's through ADDI that's available around the world. So we've been able to have proof of concept where we've generated the data, the data has been curated, harmonized, put on the platform, and we're seeing researchers access it. So it's a great proof of concept. Uh, we also need to make sure that the G7 and the other governments are on board, so we're working closely to, to see if the US, UK, and Japan can help lead this forward, a lot like a SEPI and Gavi, and get international aid funding to be able to sustain this commitment. As we build up all of this, you know, at the end of the 2025, if we're successful with our execution and our fundraising, we'll, we'll be in 75 sites, right? And we, we are in 75 sites since our inception. We'll be at 100 by the end of the year. And all this work is really, you know, the most important thing is looking at our name and seeing that we are a collaborative. And so all this work takes you guys, it takes everybody who's at this conference. And so with that, I just want to say thank you to our funders, our strategic partners, everybody who's been a thought partner when we start building this. And I'll turn it back over to Phyllis. Thanks, Drew. So, um, fun fact, Frida Liz Hall was one of my first bosses at Lilly. Yeah. yeah, so I told you that. Uh, so now you've seen kind of a high-level overview of DAC at the enterprise level. And um, I should have, should have mentioned ADDI earlier. If you have not stopped by the ADDI booth, uh, 1224, I would ask that you do that. Uh, the Gates Ventures funded Alzheimer's Disease Data Initiative is the backbone for the Davos Alzheimer's Collaborative. So our team will be on site there as well as several of the other partners and uh, the AD Workbench, which is part of that initiative, is actually the backbone for many of these pre-competitive projects. So I'm going to hand this over to my partner in crime and uh, the head of our uh, Canadian-based organization. <laughs> uh, we have a group in India, we have a group in Canada, but otherwise we're uh, pretty disaggregated. So Tim, take over. Thanks, Phyllis. Yeah, good morning, everyone.
And so last year, our friends and family, this is sort of a snapshot of where we were. Um, so we were really focused on finalizing and locking data collection for our early detection program. Um, we were working on our first iteration of the blueprint, and we were sort of in the middle of that. And uh, we also were starting to sort of shape our next wave of programs on accurate diagnosis. Um, and so this year, you know, we really significantly expanded. So um, we are processing the data into peer review publications for early detection. We're really moving into dissemination and knowledge translation on early detection with two new programs, um, the US System Fellowship, which my colleague Mike will tell you about, as well as a brain health navigator program. Um, and then we've got two new global programs. So one of those is accurate diagnosis, which Karen and Amy will talk about in a few moments, and then um, the IHI AD Riddle program that Phyllis mentioned. So, you know, in total, this sort of moves us from one to four programs um, and expands our, our site uh, footprint from uh, 12 countries to, to 23. So, um, you know, super exciting to just see that, that change. Um, so as we've expanded, we've sort of brought in new team members to help make sure that we're able to really deliver on that work. And you know that expansion is really only possible with the support of you know our sites who are working incredibly hard in the field, our team, um, as well as our funders. So big thank you to all those groups. Um, and so this year we brought in Dr. Mike Hornbecker to lead our um, system fellowship program in the U.S. So he will. Uh, come up and tell you more about that work, as well as Mary Jo Koppenhofer, um, who's helping to support that program. And then we've also brought in um, Dr. Laura Chavira to sort of lead the blueprint efforts, um, as we've got several programs that are going to start feeding that uh, website. Um, additionally, we've brought in um, a number of folks based in the EU and UK, um, Evelina and Tease Humans, to support the AU Riddle program. <coughs> Um, and then our colleague Monica, who I believe is here this morning as well, to sort of support our stats. And Monica is defending her PhD on Friday, so please wish her well. <laughs> um, okay, so you know, two sort of big deliverables to highlight over the last year. So the first was this um, blueprint, and so you know, half of the mission is really about catalyzing change in health systems, and then I think half of it is also being able to scale that knowledge and translate it really seamlessly. So in the early detection program, we worked really closely with our site leaders um, in, in the flagship programs, and they spent about nine days with us over two years, not all at once, and in, in a few different chunks, um, co-designing what would become the blueprint. So we worked really early on just you know, uh, prototyping structure, and then as we moved forward, we built content with them, we collected tools from them, and so the blueprint um, that you would find online today is, uh, is a real representation of the lessons learned of that program. And you know, our vision is over time, as we continue with US fellowships and accurate diagnosis, I think you know, this blueprint is sort of a beta version. We'll continue to update it, and we'll add in regional specificity, and uh, it, will, it will grow over time in line with our program. So we're really excited to see it um, launched in the field and expect by the end of the year one with at least 35 systems using it globally, which is great. The other big deliverable um, is this uh, Scientific American piece that is on everyone's table. So, um, you know, very cool to see uh, a, a magazine, you know, geared to uh, a more general audience. Um, and my colleagues, Phyllis, Susan Oliver, and Katie spent many, many months working very hard on this. Uh, it's, it's very, very cool. I really encourage you to check it out. Um, there's some, some really great pieces in there. Um, and then finally, as we sort of look at all of the catalyzed activity we've seen out of early detection, we've seen really good sustainment and scale globally from those programs. We, you know, in countries like Brazil, we continue to see those programs running day to day and, and finding scale um, in, in the state that the program was run in and in the US. Um, we've seen a number of our U.S. sites really either sustain or, or scale up their program. So, um, you know, we've been really heartened and excited to see that emerge over the last year. Um, we've also uh, catalyzed some work group activities, so as we found barriers in, in 
our studies to things like um, you know, education on blood-based biomarkers or TCAs, uh, challenges around algorithms for identifying patients in primary care, um, and, and challenges with the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. We worked with um, the Global COI Initiative, Voices of Alzheimer's, and, and PAD 2020 to sort of see work groups um, focused on some of those pain points. Um, and before we run 10 U.S. systems through a uh, fellowship program, um, our colleagues at our institute under Dr. Anna Burke are working with us to implement the blueprint rapidly there um, so that we get some good feedback about how we, we run a system through it. Um, so all really exciting work. And as we get into the more traditional world of disclosures, we've got five peer-reviewed manuscripts that um, should be in by the end of the year that are led by DAC. Um, we're seeing you know, 20 plus come from our sites, um, which is really, really exciting, um, as well as a significant number of conference presentations in, in our learning lab that we continue to do twice a year um, to share learnings. Um, and so, you know, just to touch on two programs before I turn it over to Amy and Karen, I think this gives a good mental model of as we've finished the early detection program and created this blueprint. Um, you know, we were really in a mode of evidence generation in these programs globally. And now we're starting to build uh, significant capability around knowledge translation um, and scale up. And so we've got these new programs in US uh, Healthcare System Fellowship and a Brain Navigator program. Um, and, you know, as our team moves into those programs, we're really focused on how do we use the blueprint broadly with a lot of systems and how do we update it over time to make sure it's really going into health system leaders and helpful and getting them to run these programs quickly and with much less resources than, than the initial studies took. So we're really excited about it. Um, and I look forward to hearing Mike and Phyllis talk more about those in a few moments. Um, and then as Phyllis mentioned, um, this IHI A Riddle program is very exciting. It's a five-year program um, really focused on a toolkit approach to uh, identification, diagnosis, and prevention. Um, and so that program's happening in sort of eight sites in the EU and UK. It has a broad consortium of uh, industry, academia, and nonprofits. So we're really excited to be a part of that program, um, and we're, we're able to take the protocols from early detection and accurate diagnosis and take them over there to make sure that the implementation evaluations are, are very consistent, which um, we're thrilled about. Um, so that's sort of the broad overview. I am very excited to introduce my colleagues, Dr. Amy Decker and Karen Weirach, um, to talk about the Accurate Diagnosis Program and all of the, the really exciting work they're doing over there. together once a month virtually, and we're going to have three in person as well. 
and they get an opportunity to share learnings and really solve some of the common challenges that they're facing. And this is where we'll be able to also co-create more learnings for the early detection blueprint that Tim was showing you. And uh, that way those learnings will be available to different health systems around the world. We have two um, concurrent research streams to help us identify the barriers and facilitators to incorporating these diagnostics as part of the um, pathway for Alzheimer's disease. So the sites are leading their uh, clinical studies, so they'll be collecting patient-level data. This will allow us to see the rates of use of these pathology assessments in the pathway. We'll be able to get an understanding of how using these assessments might change workflows and the timing between the diagnostic milestones as well as from the time we're identifying patients at risk of for cognitive issues to the time of diagnosis. We'll get an understanding of the resources that are used in the healthcare systems and what the, the cost might be that's associated with implementation. Now concurrently, DAC, we're leading our program evaluation, so again, using those methods, theories, and frameworks from implementation science. And this allows us to really unpack and understand what kind of barriers there are when we try to incorporate these tools in the diagnostic pathway, and what helps make it easier to do so. So we're really excited to, to learn all these things along the way with, with all of you and be able to share those as part of our blueprint and our other um, great uh, knowledge uh, translation tools. Karen, thank you. Um, so just a quick time out. Um, I've been with the team almost three years now. Um, and as Tim's slide showed, our team has been growing, our reach has been growing in terms of programs. And I grew up in a really small family and I was always really envious of people that got to have big family reunions. So being able to stand up here and see you all, thank you for fulfilling a need I didn't even know I had <laughs> until today. So wonderful to just kind of see the expansion that's happened. Um, speaking of which, just like to share. Oh, thank you. Um, so these are the eight wonderful sites that are joining us on the journey for accurate diagnosis. I know we have some representatives in the room today, so I'd like to ask you to stand and be recognized. We've got Kansas University. Mount Sinai, Wake Forest, Cleveland Clinic, Imperial College London, Amsterdam University Medical Center, uh, Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, and Tokyo Metropolitan Hospital. Y'all stand up. Uh, 
Um, so just in terms of where we are in the, in the progress of the program, we've really been spending the first part of this year in what we call the startup phase, which is the really not fun part of putting contracts in place and getting protocols written and approved and just kind of figuring out all the mechanics. But it's obviously the necessary part that has to be done to move on to the next phase. So we will have an approximately nine month enrollment period for each of the sites to enroll their patients followed up by a six month follow up period for those patients to work their way through the diagnostic process. Again, so we can learn how these new tools are being incorporated. And then ultimately we would look to disseminate these learnings, both through our learning lab vehicle, through publications, through our blueprint, um, like you've seen before. And so that we make sure that all health systems can learn from what we've done. And to quote the famous Phyllis Farrell, once you've seen one health system, you've seen one health system. So even though we have not yet enrolled a patient in this study, we've already learned and uncovered some challenges with how do you get the lab order written in the lab ordering system so that you can order the test for your patient? How do you educate your physicians on the test and, and what it means and why it's important and how they communicate those results to their patient? Again, lots of challenges that um, we think that DAC is uniquely positioned to address and overcome. So thank you very much and look forward to seeing you all on the next one. So um, now you see why these guys, including especially Tim, um, are uh, our right hands because they make sure that all the crazy ideas we come up with actually get implemented. Um, one thing that we should have said as Tim was going through our team, you saw those 11 faces. Only five of those individuals are working full time on the program. But 49 programs across 18 countries being delivered by five people working full time. The rest of that crew, we are using disruptive career management and, uh, and making sure we're taking advantage of wisdom in. Uh, in retirees and uh, folks that want to continue to give back. But I'm here to say they may not be full-time in their time, but they are full-time in their hearts, which is one of the reasons why this is a collaborative, because we know all of you are also part of that. So I want to introduce you to our newest um, kind of full-time hire. We thought it was probably a really good idea to have a doctor on staff. And what we realized when we put this blueprint together, we thought, oh, we go to AIC every year. Everybody believes in early detection. Everyone thinks there's value of early detection. We will just put this blueprint out there and everyone will come and use it. Didn't work. So what we realized was we um, needed to find health systems that wanted to do this, but needed some help with um, some financial and some technical support. And so with that, we have commissioned this new program called the Health System Fellowship that RFI closed last night. And we hired Dr. Michael Hornbecker to lead that for us. He is a primary care physician who did actually do cognitive assessments in clinical practice. So we know it's, we know it's possible to do. And he's going to lead us through this uh, next overview. Thank you, Phyllis. Um, and uh, yeah, two months ago, my life looked a lot different because I just transitioned out of clinical practice um, to be full-time with DAC. Um, a little better, okay. Uh, to be full-time with DAC, but I couldn't be more honored to be here to talk to you guys about the uh, U.S. Health uh, System Fellowship. So again, just some high-level overview um, of what the fellowship is going to look like. So we're going to be selecting 10 sites across the United States and really looking for some diversity in the sites that we select and diversity not just in the patients served and the social determinants of health that they may face, but also diversity in geographical location, diversity in payer type, diversity in um, healthcare system context and healthcare system type. So really everything from a, a small rural clinic to a community hospital all the way up to a large national healthcare organization. I'm happy to say we have a very good representation of all those types in the RFIs that we've had submitted so far, well, submitted since we just closed the RFI. Um, and then once we choose our sites, we will be providing them with some seed funding as well as the technical uh, assistance and training uh, that they need to start their own program of early detection. Uh, to start that program, we will be using DAX Blueprint. Um, 
So part of the, and I'll talk about on my next slide here, part of the training that we'll do will be blueprint based, where we really get the site leaders to use the blueprint to actually build um, the uh, early detection program within their primary care settings. And you know what we get out of this then is very good feedback uh, in a methodical way on the blueprint itself so that we can sort of break it down and then rebuild it into a uh, US specific blueprint for um, starting early detection programs in primary care. So a little bit about what that curriculum of the program will look like. So uh, we talked about community of practice, uh, Amy and Karen did, and we will still have that in this program, but we're actually gonna do things just a little bit differently where we have sort of three touch points on a monthly basis with our site leaders. So the first will be a little bit of a, a homework assignment, if you will, where we ask the site leaders to independently work through a portion of the blueprint um, and then come to the small group session, which is our sort of second touch point, with a deliverable, and that deliverable might be a, a, um, a program uh, like proposal or a budget or a list of key stakeholders uh, that they need to engage with in their healthcare system. Um, but we want them to really go through and go through the goals and the actions and the blueprint and really go through the steps. Um, when they come to that small group meeting, we'll use that uh, in sort of dyads and triads of the, of the site leaders to sort of you know break down those assignments, talk about the, that portion of the blueprint that they. Um, that they went through and then talk about the barriers and, and some mitigation strategies and provide that training and technical assistance to make, through, make sure we can get them through those steps. And then finally, we will come together in a monthly community of practice with all 10 site leaders where we really, as the slide says there, you know, try to promote and capture the peer-to-peer -peer learnings um, and deliver the training and technical assistance that's necessary. And then finally, uh, sort of work together to build that U.S. specific uh, blueprint so that we can you know, come out of this on the other side with a blueprint that's ready to use in the United States. So again, just some high level timelines. So as we said, the, uh, we launched the portal on May 31st. It closed, well, it was supposed to close a week ago, but thanks to CrowdStrike, we got an extra week. Um, but the, the, it did close late last night. Um, so we'll be in the process after AAIC of reviewing those applications. And then by the 16th of September, we will select our 10 sites and then we're hoping to kick off the program uh, in late Q4 of 2024. So really excited to get started. And with that, I'll start with that yeah, just when you think you're you know, protected from CrowdStrike, we were not. But actually, I think it was good because I think we had a few sites that were rushing at the end. So they might not actually have needed the extra time for CrowdStrike, but they needed it for other reasons. Um, a couple of things. In front of you if it, are these overviews. So if we've thrown out a lot of words that you don't like, say, no, what was that? Or what was that? So it's right here, kind of explained for you, as well as the QR code to the website and the link to the foundational paper. Also, if you want to see what DAP and our sites are up to here at AIC on the back, our uh, posters and presentations. This is also being recorded, and all the slides will be made available. So one of the things about this collaborative is that it is all open. We are in a pre-competitive space, and it's one of the reasons that our strategic partners are so critically important, and we are so thankful for them, because they know that they are giving their tools, their um, product, and their data in such a way that it can be used in a pre-competitive way. So, um, so that's really exciting. And I'm very excited to announce our newest program uh, being announced today. Um, thank goodness, because we signed the contract on Friday. Um, and, um, and this is the Brain Health Navigator program. So as we were running the early detection program, one of the things we realized was each of the sites were kind of coming up organically with this solution, what they call the Brain Health Navigator or uh, Nurse Navigator. They had a little bit different names. And what we realized is that patients really needed someone to help them navigate through the diagnostic journey process. So we've seen that patient navigators in oncology, right? But that typically happens post-diagnosis. What, what systems needed and what patients needed was someone to help them get through this diagnostic journey, which is incredibly complicated. And if anybody has lived through this, I am here to tell you it is a nightmare to go through. And so with that, um, we have kicked off a new program. We will be selecting up to six sites to, well, I gotta slide on this. 
up to slip six slide sites to basically create a brain health navigator model. So what does that mean? Things like the job description, if a system wanted to put in a brain health navigator, how it can get reimbursed, what kind of state licensure is needed, what's happening at the federal level, so this first program is going to be done in the U.S. because in a lot of cases, how um, the system works is very local. Even here in the United States, it might actually be at the state level uh, as well as the national level. But we're really hopeful that we're going to find some partners to allow us to replicate this program, um, as Drew mentioned, in the U.K. and Japan. So if you know anybody who thinks that, boy, that's a really good idea, I think they would help us get this done in the U.K. or Japan. Um, let us know. We're going to have some of those conversations here at AIC. But that program is kicking off um, as we speak. We're actually starting to have some meetings here at AIC. And once again, that will be a model and a toolkit that's made uh, available pretty competitively. So, um, in front of you, please take the Scientific American magazine with you. Please take some stickers. Um, we'd love to have you join us in telling people what the collaborative is. As I mentioned, uh, we are a small, mighty, and somewhat crazy team, but uh, it only happens because we've got partners um, like you all that are helping spread the word. So with that, I'd like to invite our chairman up to close the remarks. Thank you.
the central fact of these programs uh, is how to link and scale things around the world. So it's not just that we have 10 foot ladders, as Elias Sigourney used as an analogy, but how do you begin to get a 20 foot ladder, or a 30 foot ladder, or a 40 foot ladder that is linking uh, people around the world? So it's not just that we have these extraordinary programs, is that they're linked uh, so that we learn from ourselves around the world. And that is learning from low resource settings and high resource settings, because all of us are under developed resource settings when it comes to Alzheimer's. And so this is one where linking and scaling these efforts is so critical. But through a learning lab, which we do twice a year, where we have several hundred people and uh, 100 organizations to learn about the latest developments that have occurred in Kenya or Korea or India or Latin America. Uh, but it's also the community of practice, which tends to drive every month a learning process uh, of linking and scaling across these programs. So it's not just isolated efforts, it is linking them. The cohorts that uh, Drew described uh, in Kenya and in multiple sites around the world, uh, those, the evidence developed, the samples developed from, from genetic, from the blood, which is biomarkers and genetics, and the visual cognitive assessments, which we do longitudinally, are all put into a common data set. So it's not just a set of cohorts, it's a set of linked cohorts uh, that are collecting the same data, uh, the same genetic uh, materials, uh, so that we can compare the genetics of someone in Africa uh, with African Americans, the Latinos with the Latino Americans, or whatever. It is finding those things like the Christchurch variant in Colombia, the country of Colombia, where we found a variant that is protective against familial forms of the disease. It's the Icelandic variant. We're finding variants, uh, genetic variants around the world, which are protective. That's the only way to do that is to look at the world, not just look at your people who look just like us, just like uh, you know, white Americans. So the linking and scaling is critical to the theory of change. But there's now beginning to be a movement around this. It's come up with the language of brain health, uh, which is becoming a bit of a movement, uh, which now we have national plans in Europe uh, with brain health plans. Uh, India's developing a brain health plan. Europe is now developing a brain health plan for Europe. The United States, which had this uh, national strategic plan, uh, which had a goal by 2025 of uh, treating and, of, and effectively preventing the disease, which we've only did about 10% of that. Uh, but now we've reauthorized that to 2035. So we're going to be going through a process in the United States of reimagining what a 2035 goal is with respect to this, but linking the brain health efforts in the United States Europe and around the world is going to be essential. And you know who's going to lead a lot of this is Africa. Cameroon just had a conference on the science of brain health in Africa, where obviously the aging demographic has shifted lower, but they've now seen how brain health has a life course aspect to it, that in fact things can happen in infancy and in teenage years and a variety of different contexts through life that have an effect on your brain resilience, your brain power, and your brain capacity. Uh, so they're developing a life force effort in, in, in Cameroon. They made an announcement this week. We will take that to the Nairobi conference uh, in September. We'll take this to the United Nations General Assembly uh, in, 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 in September as well. Uh, and the former prime minister of Cameroon was the chairman of the African Brain Coalition. And so we anticipate the UN General Assembly taking action this. Now, what does the UN General Assembly actually move in the world? Big question. But nevertheless, the sense that the brain is central both to economic progress in the world, which is increasingly dependent on great brains, and on suppressing brain disorders uh, that happen during the course of life is going to be essential. So we are driving this you know, through a variety of efforts. Uh, we will have a, a conference in Nairobi in September. Uh, we're having a Lausanne, a traditional Lausanne dialogue on number 11 uh, in October, uh, where the head of the EMA is speaking, which will be interesting to see, given the decision they just tentatively made with respect to the community uh, in, in Europe. Uh, we have a G7 health ministers event in Ancona, Italy, in, in October as well. And so we're driving this uh, to a, hopefully a brain house at Davos, at the World Economic Forum in January to try and drive a global movement around this. So yes, we're ambitious, 
But if you got people like Phyllis, you know you can achieve your ambitions. So thank you all for being friends and family. It is wonderful to see we're big enough to have friends and family. A <laughs> uh, line that was given to me by someone who was quite right to a Thank you very much. Thank you.